All right, pre-show shenanigans, Grant. We're going to keep this one quick, and it does kind of go into to sports in general, but we have a new curse, Grant. There is a new curse among us. Um, it is the Sabrina Carpenter curse. Every jersey of a team that she has worn to this point, namely the Phillies and the Toronto Maple Leafs, have immediately been eliminated or lost. Oh, she's the reason the Maple Leafs got game. bounced? Uh, yeah, so oh, Leafs, Leafs lost the season opener to Montreal, which was right after, I guess, she wore this jersey. And then the Phillies, immediately after she posted or was posted a picture wearing a Phillies jersey out of the series. There was one other one. Uh, there's a picture of her wearing uh, an England, like, national team jersey. And England obviously hasn't won a World Cup or anything. Yeah, so. no, they, they haven't won a World Cup since 1966, I believe. So I'm just saying there is a cur- there is an ongoing. Cur- I have to do more investigation into this. But so are you saying that as a collective community, every sports fandom should be saying, please, please, please don't be a fan of my team to Sabrina Carpenter? Please, please, please don't wear my. It's not even a fan. It's don't wear my jersey. Don't be a fill. Yeah. So it's yeah. No, like the curse will always be with Drake. Uh, oh yes. 100%. Anytime Drake ever associates with your school you know you're about to lose uh i'll keep my eye on sabrina carpenter i i wasn't quite aware of this curse i was not aware of it until last now i am and i'm gonna keep my eye on it uh hmm yeah that you know that that one is interesting i would say uh sabrina carpenter you know it maybe hey as an as la guys ourselves there's a lot of fake fans out in LA. I'll be honest. Me, Sabrina Carpenter coming from LA, bringing over that fake fan energy. That's not what we want. That's, yeah, there's pictures of her. Uh, that's Maple not going to produce England, Phillies. Uh, I see one with a Rays jersey. Um, uh, does she? Um, I if I were to guess, if she's ever been pictured wearing anything related to the NBA, it is a million percent a Laker jersey. Yeah, I just looked up Sabrina Carpenter wearing jerseys, and I'm really only finding those three. Uh, so I, I don't see any NBA yet. It has not happened. All right, we we'll monitor this. We'll yeah, we'll this keep is an on ongoing this. situation. Yeah, uh, we'll 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 see we'll see what's come of this. But uh, Sabrina Carpenter, you're now on the the shit list. Uh, you're on the watch list. You you're you're a detriment. So. We'll we'll be looking into that. I I I I I was trying to think, think of is there any like the biggest curses without question is Drake and the Madden curse. Um, how many teams does Sabrina Carpenter need to curse to reach that level? I think it just needs to be continual. Like the Drake curse is continual. It's not. Yeah, just I'm not sure rappers. if Drake has ever ever uh supported a team and they won. Raptors. Other than the Raptors 2019 ship, but that was more the Warriors getting injured. Yeah, but more they still so won. Yeah, I mean, they still, they the still Raptors. won. The Drake curse should, that even is with, true. with injury, should break. No, no, yeah, that, 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 that is true. That is true. Uh, Ky- Kawhi is just different. He just manhandled the curse, I guess. I'll never get over that that shot he hit over, uh, what was it, Embiid? Or, no, no, it was yeah, over Embiid. Jimmy. And uh, uh, it was Embiid. I don't really know. I can't remember. No, it part. was over Embiid. It, it was, was, yeah. Embiid. Uh, yeah, no, that that one's in my mind forever. But uh, yes, yeah, Sabrina Carpenter, we're watching you. We're watching you closely. Uh, but without further ado, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Waterboy Podcast. Today is episode two hundred sixty-four, and the Dodgers picked up a massive win last night to go up. Uh, not go up in the series, tie it up 2-2. Right. The Mets are the team of destiny. Uh, the Mets are inevitable. Uh, they have all the vibes that the Phillies have had the past two seasons. The D-backs had last year. Uh, they have team of destiny vibes. Uh, we're, we have the biggest week of college football that we have to preview coming up here. I know last week, it'll be tough to top last week, the apple picking week. And then in NFL, we we have major stuff. Uh, another London game. Uh, I I guess it's just for this month. Is the London games? I haven't I, guess, I haven't checked down also, the line. There's like I think there's like one almost like every week or something. I'm not entirely yeah. sure. 
Yeah, I mean, at, at this but, point, it, it's a little absurd, and I feel like the Jaguars in London, uh, they just go hand in hand. They're they're off over yeah. the pond again. So you know, why don't we start with the NFL? That way, we can kind of figure out where where the vibes at. You know, following following the NFL. Yeah, so I'm very excited to talk about the NFL coming off a very hot week. Uh, the tides are turning for me. Um, ever I went ten and four last week. Okay. I went seven. Uh, Chiefs, Chiefs won that game. I went eight and seven. So uh, that that puts me at an overall record. Of, no, the, those it should be eight and six. Eight and six. I I think you have something wrong here, buddy. I think you're. Oh, it is eight and six. It is eight and six. I, yeah, I, no, I, there I were four teams wrong. on bye week. So I, that I was... had something wrong. I I misread that. I misread that. Um. Uh. So what's the overall record looking now? I would be thirty four and. 27 27 yeah quick yeah down. so i'm 32 and 29 you're drawing very, in. hey we are getting to the i'm very proud to say we are that getting to the i am over the season i'm over so. 500 after that first week i believe uh uh let, let me pull this up uh yeah i started off seven and nine uh then follow that up with a five and ten week uh we're back over 500 that uh, does mean that i have the penalty of putting the games first um yeah you are reading the games this week everett it is unfortunate. It, it seems to be that time of the season where I will just be reading the games for every single. I day. I'm I'm afraid that this is happening earlier than it normally does, though. Uh, it's been a it's been a weird year, though. To be fair, to be it, fair. Oh, I think this has been probably the most random NFL year of of all time. Like, oh, we'll go over it a little bit more in a second, but uh, it's now four of the past five weeks that the team with the largest point spread favorite of the week, lost outright to the underdog. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we've seen something like this ever in the NFL. Uh, it truly is any given Sunday this year. Uh, yeah, Throw everything out the window. All your preseason expectations, forget them. They're gone. Uh, we're, now, we're now five weeks in. Uh, this is just the NFL right now. So... Okay. Um oh, I forgot that, that game was in London this week. I think I hold on. I got to I got to change. I got to change something real quick. I'll be honest. Uh for the London game, I I'm, I'm just picking uh one way purely because it's the London game, yeah, but that's what I just changed my I answer don't, to. I do. don't think I like it, but I don't yeah. love it. I had it the other way and then I just realized it was the London game so I switched. But okay, Grant, here we go. Uh Thursday night matchup. We have the 49ers at the Seahawks. Sunday, uh, get your crumpets ready, all right? 8.30 a.m., we have the Jaguars versus the Bears. Then noon slate, we have Cardinals at Packers, Colts at Titans, Texans at Patriots, Bucks at Saints, Browns at Eagles, and Commanders at Ravens. Uh, Mid-afternoon slate, we have Chargers at Broncos, uh, Steelers at Raiders, Lions at Cowboys, Falcons at Panthers, and then the night game is Bengals at Giants. Wrapping it up Monday night, we have the Bills at the reinvented New York Jets. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll see. That that should be a fun Monday yeah. night game. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, Grant, these are these are my picks for this week. All right, 49ers had the Bears just change it for to the Jags after realizing it's a Europe game. Uh, Cardinals, Colts. Texans, Bucks, Eagles, Ravens, Chargers, Steelers, Lions, Falcons, Bengals, and Bills. All right, some slight differences here, uh, but pretty pretty similar overall. But uh, all you need is two game difference. That's all you need. It's all you yeah, need. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll be honest. I I felt like you could pick up a win on me here, taking Broncos over Chargers, but. Uh, I just don't I'll think get it's into that happen. in a second. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. What I think, but uh, here, here are my picks for Seahawks. Can give me the, the birds. The give me too. Seahawks. I need, I need the. I was going to, but I we don't have uh, the audio warning, uh, oh. sound well, here, and, and everything set up. Just be like audio warning. Uh, you know, I've I've learned in the past. Uh, I've have a tendency to break the decibel counter uh on the premiere 
uh, editing software whenever I do my Seahawks. Uh, so you, you, I won't give you guys the full gusto this time, but just know when I pick the Seahawks in my head, I it's was immediate. I immediately thought of doing the Paca, but chose not to for you guys. So you guys are welcome. Seahawks, Paca. Jaguars, Grawl, uh, Packers, <laughs> Titans, Texans, Saints, Eagles, Ravens, Steelers, Chargers, Lions, Falcons, all road afternoon slate, Bengals and Bills. I'm going all road. So our, our games later. of destiny will be early afternoon slate. Yeah. Yeah, so our difference is uh, Niners, Seahawks, Cardinals, Packers, Colts, Titans, and Bucks, Saints. Uh, my immediate, my immediate first thought with Cardinals, Packers. Uh, I'm gonna put a finger up here. I cannot get a read on the Cardinals to save my life this year. Okay, <laughs> I believe I'm zero and five this year in games with the Cardinals involved. Every time they've won. I've picked against them. I'm just Every time they've the lost, bus. I've picked the, them. The wheels on the bus are going round and round right now. Uh, I like the Packers uh, here, though. I, I just feel like, objectively speaking, the Packers are a much better football team than the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, and also, Will Hernandez out for the year. Uh, Cardinals, a thing I really liked early on the year, uh, was their use of 12 and 13 personnel spreading out uh opposing teams d lineman i thought that really benefited their inside run game the most uh by having a lot of guys on the line of scrimmage forcing d tackles to space out a little bit more but with will hernandez out maybe some slight concerns with the cardinals run game uh and i'm not sure if the kyler marv connection is quite so there yet the the run game definitely is you know it, it will be an issue with hernandez out my one thing though that i will say is I believe the Packers defensive line is a little banged up as well. And also with a James Connor, like. Well, I'd uh, say that and they're washed. Uh, my fun <laughs> fact of the day, Rashawn Gary, who I've had quite a fun uh, time talking about Michigan players uh, and how their careers have failed because they went to Michigan when they could have gone somewhere else. Uh, shout out Jabril Peppers, shout out Donovan Peoples-Jones, shout out Rashawn Gary. I remember all of you. I remember all of you. I, I I will never forgive what the University of Michigan did to you guys and your careers. Uh, but Rashawn Gary right now, I believe he's only like 27, 28, 29 years yeah. old. Uh, he is now recording the slowest get off of his NFL career, uh, about 0.1 seconds slower than his NFL career average. Rashawn Gary is either washed or he doesn't give a shit about planks. So either way, not a recipe for success. Uh, you don't want to be washed or just lazy. Both are both are a bad sign for your edge rusher. I'm pretty sure you just got paid a lot of money for it. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, no, slight concern over there. Uh, if there's a bright spot on the Packers uh, defense so far this season, it would probably be Xavier McKinney. I believe he's had an interception yeah, every game every so far. Game. Yes. Uh, so bright spot uh, in the secondary there. Uh, I will just say I, I kind of like the one-on-one matchup between Marv. I am as as a Marv fanboy. That's that's a get your popcorn ready matchup. I'm very excited to see what happens well, there. If Jair, if Jair had a back out of a matchup with Justin Jefferson, I'm just curious what's going to happen in this one. Um, but I, I I think that Kyler's just been playing better than than Jordan Love to this point, and I think that um, I feel like Kyler's been a little strange to me in a way. Uh, I, I'm seeing a little Cam Ward out of him right now. He's making a bunch of like, wow, holy shit, Kyler is Kyler plays. But he's also having a couple of what the hell moments. No, yeah, Where are I, you I even looking? That. There's dudes wide open down the field. Uh, I, I so also just think as a general note, um, if that offensive line breaks down a little bit, though, Kyler Murray is probably going to be able to make those plays so i'm just i'm entrusting the bus and kyler a little bit more than i trust well like for the o-line play uh i'm more concerned like run game wise without will hernandez how will that impact early down yeah but also the efficiency same time. uh kyler scrambling will will hernandez being hurt i don't i have vikings not concerned well, pass I'm, more rush so, I'm more so just saying pass rush kyler murray will be able to get around with whoever that backup guard is going to be but uh, I mean, based off of just the way at least the Vikings game looked, uh, I know it was Aaron Jones, but um, 
I, I, I think that you can work around not having Will Hernandez and be fine. Um, but, but Grant, really what I want to know is why the, uh, the Seahawks over the 49ers? Uh, Pretty much uh, divisional window, throw everything out the window, vibes, uh, Seattle at home. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I just vibes. vibes. Uh, everything's Not, telling me, JSN. everything's telling me pick the 49ers. Uh, uh, no, JSN, if anything, JSN's a detriment to my reason to pick the, the Seahawks. <laughs> JSN looks awful right now. Uh, no, no, that has nothing to do with it at all. Uh, it's just pure vibes. Uh, this is a game where like, Seahawks three and two, Niners two and three, Niners coming off a loss. Like, there's no way the Niners I'm, go two and four. Yeah. That's so give me of, the Seahawks. I'm kind so of, give me the I'm Seahawks. I'm kind of thinking that, but I'm also thinking vibe wise, like throw everything out the window, divisional play, right? It's in Seattle. It's noisy, whatever, right? Like, 49ers haven't looked great. And that's exactly why I think they fix it with the, the Seahawks. So, because also speaking vibe wise, well, in, I don't in think the NFC West, going into Seattle's your get in, right game. In the NFC West, though, the 49ers are typically good, except for when it's the Rams. That's my other thing. I, I'm honestly curious what Kyle Shanahan record versus Seahawks. It is different. It's no longer Pete Carroll, by the way. Like, I, I don't yeah, so, think it applies. Um, I believe. Uh, did did the Niners go two and zero against Seahawks last year? I have no clue. Do you? Would you? No. Think so. Chance. If he did, then Kyle Shanahan uh, is perfect five hundred his career against the Seattle Seahawks. Tied even. If he went two and zero last year, he's eight and eight career against the through, Seahawks through uh before last season started. Yeah. It, if he went two and zero last season, yeah. He would be yeah, 500. See. If he went he, one and one, he'd have a negative record against he Seattle. Went, he went uh, two and zero. Oh. Okay, so he is 500 career. Yes, yeah, so against you the want Seahawks. a definition of something where you throw everything out the window. That's quite literally the definition of. It. So I mean, hey, valid, yeah, so valid Seattle, pick, val- valid pick, valid pick. But uh, I, I can't see the 49ers going two and four. And I mean, Brandon Ayuk finally looks good finally so i'm yeah uh it. maybe it's a lesson to not hold out uh in off yeah season. maybe you think you would have learned that one after that and the, and then when you come back just wear the correct shorts to practice maybe yeah maybe not be a diva i know that's difficult for some wide receivers but yeah i thought diva was the diva on the team i guess it's like you also uh but um whatever. bucks saints spencer you're taking uh, spencer rattler to win his first game yeah, That's no, yeah, yeah. This one, uh, I'm looking at the point spread here, and I, I feel like it, it might be, should be a little bit more to Tampa. Uh, and if I look at this three and a half spread for Tampa, I'm sitting there thinking if I were a dummy idiot moron who checks in the NFL every once in a while, I would look at that game and be like, box house 401k on it. No, no, Saints. See, Give me the Saints. Is, this is my thing. Saints. This is my thing with this game. All right. First of all, prayers to everybody that just went through the hurricane uh, in Tampa, Hurricane Milton, right? For me, if I'm the Bucks, my head, my argument would be their head's not in the game. There's stuff going on at home. Like, I've been there. I've been through it with Tulane. I understand. Um, but at the same time, I think that, the way that the Bucks are playing right now is just Baker Mayfield's a wagon. Baker Mayfield's a wagon right now. And uh, I think Bucks look good. Uh, and I think with Spencer Rattler starting his first career game, I'm not confident in Spencer Rattler. I am not uh, at all. It's the uh, same as thing a man- with Drake May. It's the same thing with Drake May. Why, like, obviously the Patriots suck, but... I don't. I just don't love rookie quarterbacks when their first career starts in general. Yeah, that's fair. I'd say for me, uh, I I used to be a massive, massive believer in injuries, uh, and I was oh, if a major guy's out, give me the other team. Uh, I remember doing that. That was a lot of my picking strategy. Well, Derek first Carr's year on the podcast. So uh, I don't well, know well I that as well. That. Uh, I yeah, I'd say though I've I I've fallen into the trap where I 
one injury happens, I just pick the other team. No, no, no I've learned. I've learned my lesson. I'm no dummy anymore. You can't trick me anymore, Vegas. Uh, no, yeah, I don't care who's starting quarterback. Taysom Hill could be the starting quarterback. I, that actually made me feel better. Taysom Hill uh, would make me feel much better. And yeah, I, I do not care. Give me the Saints. I know Mike Evans is going to be a non-factor, but I think everything else kind of points me towards the Bucks. Yeah, no, 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 no. Quite, quite literally, everything's telling me to pick Tampa Bay. So give me the Saints. <laughs> I mean, you, you and I, I, I feel like everything is more so pointing towards the Saints minus Spencer Rattler. Though. That's kind of more so why I went on the Bucks. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Saints, Katrina vibes. We're doing this for the city. We're winning this game for the city of Tampa Bay. Wait, wait, Saint what Tampa Bay vibes or I'm thinking New Orleans so, vibes. No, after after they were Katrina and everything, the Saints were we're doing this, we're winning for the for the city, we won the Super Bowl all the whole time and kind of thing. I think instead of it being more so a detriment with your minds and the game elsewhere, I think that this the hurricane, everybody going through everything, the one thing that can unite everybody in Tampa is their team winning this game they're gonna win this game for wait the so the tampa. vibes are for tampa you just said the vibes are for saints. tampa Bay. yeah i was comparing the saints to katrina oh. here. that was so, the oh point. okay okay uh yeah winning uh, the game okay. the bucks are gonna win the game for the city of tampa Bay. oh okay okay yeah no like that's the most vibe pick you could possibly have is a team winning something for a natural issue oh yeah true 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 to know yeah but even more to my point, you're, you're helping me there. Yeah, everything is telling me Tampa. Vibes are on Tampa. Logic is on Tampa. Injuries are on Tampa. Everything's on Tampa. So give me the New Orleans Saints. All right. I, I mean, you, you do you. I'm, I mean. I'm yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's a game that I feel like Tampa should be more than a three and a half point favorite. And it shocks me they aren't. And I, I sn- I'm sniffing a little kizzy on this one. Uh, so, something's fishy. So, some, <laughs> some doesn't smell right there. So, yeah, give me Saints. Uh, we we didn't have any other disagreements. Uh, I would talk about the London game, but no, yeah. I'm not. Uh, gross. I'm most excited this week for Commanders Ravens. Uh, great. I'm game. going off the trend of spread, so that that is the second largest spread of the week, other than Browns Eagles. That's a nine and a half point spread. Yeah was the eagles and i no i refuse to pick the cleveland browns right now no uh but commanders ravens this seems like a game where a lot of people i feel like there's going to be a good amount of people picking commanders here six and a half points that's give me that you want to talk about vibe picks the vibe is much higher for Jaden daniels right now and oh a million percent even oh, though the Ravens a million are technically percent. favorited, it's just Lamar. What Lamar's Lamar? Just Lamar. What Lamar's doing last, right now yeah. is just yeah. Yeah. So uh, last week, who 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 did the Ravens beat again? Bengals. Remember? Bengals. They, uh, we had yes, that yes, kick. yes. So in that game, kind of one thing which I kind of found interesting: the Bengals were kind of just daring Lamar to pass all game. Uh, they they weren't. They weren't stack or they were stacking the box. They were presenting them with passing looks, and Lamar took that and ran with it. Uh, L- Lamar last week passed his way to, I, b- I believe, forty-one points for Baltimore. Uh, everything I've thought over the past couple of years with the Ravens, how they seem like a team where they need to be on schedule. They can't play from behind. They need to have a lead. They're built running the football. If they're down double digits in the second half and they have to pass, things aren't going to end up well for them. But with how Lamar is throwing the ball right now, uh, maybe the Ravens have more than one way of winning uh, moving forward. And if that's true, well, oh shit. Now the Ravens are horrifying. If they can now come back in games two. Uh, Commanders get out fast. They're they're like you, uh, like the Vikings. They get off fast. They have hot starts. They score quick. Get on the board very early. And I think the Ravens' defense, though, like I I think Ravens have one of the best defenses in the NFL. And oh, I, completely, I think I completely up to this that. point, this is going to be the biggest challenge Jaden Daniels has faced all year. Uh, I kind of think the Ravens are going to cover this. Uh, 
Yeah, but just, just going off of the trends of the spreads, hey, sprinkle that Commanders money. Just line, for folks. reference, uh, the uh, the one loss the Commanders have is to Tampa Bay, so it's respectable. Uh, it was a seventeen point loss, and they didn't score any points until the second. Yeah, and, and it was week one too. Week one jitters for Jaden. He, he can get a slight pass for that one. Uh, since then, though. I mean, they've really just beat up some pretty bad to mid-tier teams, minus, I guess. I mean, I guess you can't even really talk about the Bengals being a good team right now, I mean, record-wise or not. The Bengals' they, defense is atrocious. They've, it they've is. Beat up, they've beat up the Giants, the Bengals, the Cardinals, and the Browns. Everything kind of is telling me, I mean, this is a first big test. And everybody's, for me, it's pointing to, I don't think that they're that yeah, no, I, I, I think the Ravens are probably going to cover this. Uh, I will NFL say, though, this fandom is what I will wise, say. we want the Commanders to be in this game. And... I think, I think the Commanders are going to win the NFC beast. Oh, I don't I think, think that's a hot take at all. Uh, and, I, I honestly haven't let checked. Me, let me say why I'm about. I'm about to check the lines. I'm, I'm, yeah, a, oh, I'm about to, I'm about to tell you the rest of their season. All right, Grant. After the Ravens, this is their schedule. I'm not going to say home or away. I'm just going to say opponents. They play the Bears, the Giants, the Steelers, the Eagles twice, obviously, the Cowboys twice, the Titans, Saints, and the Falcons. All of those games, minus maybe a choke to the Steelers' defense, seem win. Yeah, uh, so I'm just checking NFC East division winner odds today. Uh, Eagles are the slight favorite at around plus 130 to plus 140. Commanders are next, uh, anywhere from plus 180 to plus 200. Then Cowboys around plus 250, and Giants at plus 3,000. So they're, they're oh saying God. Giants are out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but, Giants are not making it, unfortunately. Uh, according to Vegas, Commander is only just slightly behind uh, Philly. Washington is only just behind Philly. Uh, it's going to come down to of... who wins that first game versus each other. Oh, yeah. Uh, please, please get, tell me those games are late. Uh they are late. It's uh November fourteenth is the first game. Okay, so that's good. Like we we should have tight tight Which divisional I games. Out is a Thursday night football game. Prime video Thursday. Thanksgiving. Night. Uh no. Thanksgiving no no no. That's week before Thanksgiving. Okay. Yeah. I, I I feel like I do this every year, but uh without doubt, always Cowboys Lions on Thanksgiving. Uh, uh, Cowboys play the Commanders on twenty fourth. At noon. Yes, that that's Thanksgiving. That is they play the Cowboys, play the Commanders. Oh, oh, that's live. Jane Daniels on that. Oh, NFL knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. <laughs> let's see, let's uh, see who, who the Lions, Lions play. play the, uh, 24th, they play at the Colts. Not as much. Uh, Joe Fly, if Joe Fla- Flacco plays, maybe. He's maybe. the only man that can save Thanksgiving, Joe maybe. Flacco. Yeah, that's uh, well, we need I to have think, a bird back there at well, quarterback. I, Flacco, I, I do. I mean, is Thanksgiving typically what typically it's typically, like let me check third or, or fourth, fourth Thursday or yeah, the last Thursday of the November 28th? It's, it's the always 28th. the last I, Thursday. I was looking at the wrong day. Let me let me double check. Yeah, no, no, it should. Yeah, it is 28th. Ohio State and Michigan's on the 30th. Yeah. yeah, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Lions play the Bears. Okay. Oh, and, let's go. Uh, let's go. The Cowboys. Oh my God, I can't find them. Cowboys play. Oh, stinker. Giants. Oh, that's supposed to be the first Sunday night football. Like, come on. That's a three thirty game. Let's. I'm just gonna. I, I just gotta double check. Hold on. Let me. Let me just look and see if I can. Find them. Yeah, Miami plays Green Bay that night. Stinkers. Just straight Fair. stinkers. All yeah, yeah, no, that's gonna be awful. That, that's oh god. Anyways, uh, all right. Yeah, yeah no, last, it's, last it's gonna be thing. a college basketball Thanksgiving, folks. La- it's last thing college thing I basketball. I want to say, Grant, with the NFL, uh, I, uh, you know, I want you to both. Just, oh, okay. Yeah, you, you go. You go. You go. We both know Andrew Van Ginkle has multiple uh, pick sixes this season. Grant um, was one of them not a fumble recovery. I don't know why I'm remembering. Pick sixes. No, okay, okay. Uh, this is how many... This is who Andrew Van Ginkle has more touchdowns than this season to this point, uh, October 10th. Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, 
Debo Samuel. Certainly AJ, Waddle. A.J. Brown. No, not Waddle. A.J. Really? Brown, Devonta Smith, Cooper Cup, fair injured, Travis Kelsey, Tyler Lockett, DeAndre Hopkins, and Josh Jacobs. Van Ginkle has more touchdowns. I feel like there should be a lot more guys on that list that are being names. I think they're at least tied at two. Okay, okay. Yeah, a couple of those guys have been out for a while, uh, but still, it's ridiculous. Van 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 Ginkle's well, really, out here. It's only cups. AJ and Cooper. Well, he's Cup. been hurt. That's since what I'm saying. Won. Those are the only two that. Yeah. Well, I guess Debo missed a little bit of time. Still, Josh Jacobs missed a week or two, right? No, Josh Jacobs been playing. He hasn't missed time. Oh, yet. oh, no, 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 he just he was just shit. That was what. <laughs> he he, there you go. Yeah, 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 that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah NFL. So. Th- this should be an interesting week. Uh, I I will say also this week. Um, well, I'll track it a little bit. But I went all teams coming off of buys. So Titans, Eagles, Chargers, and Lions all coming off a of buy. Uh, I I was looking up short term. Uh, straight up, it's not no major correlation. But against the spread, teams coming off the buy do very well. Uh, and all the teams coming off yeah, the bye are favorited. Will Levis. So, uh, oh, none. A- absolutely zero faith. None at all. But like, I, I don't, I don't think the Colts are, are necessarily that great. And like, I see the Titans just somehow winning. That's fair. Uh, okay. it's, I don't feel good about that one. Hell no. <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on. That's like a the... close your eyes, pick it. Don't watch it. If it hits, it hits. If it doesn't, oh, well. <laughs> let's move on to college football, Grant. I do just want to say one thing before we get into the games. Um, I have a list of players who have already opted out for the season with red shirts. I just wanted to specify. I, I want to hear this. I want to hear this. I will say half of this list is UCF players. <laughs> okay. So... Obviously, UNLV quarterback Matthew Slo- uh, Sluka, uh, Alabama defensive tackle Jaheim Otis, USC defensive tackle Bear Alexander, mm-hmm. <clears throat> UCF kicker Colton Boomer, wide receiver Xavier Townsend, defensive oh, end thumbnail, Hall, or I, thumbs up just popped up on the Zoom. <laughs> uh, right tackle Wes Dorsey, safety Byron Threats, and safety William Wells. I think they lost both starting safeties. Uh, and then Iowa wide receiver Caleb Brown and Iowa running back Rashawn. So currently at one, two, three, four, five. It's funny you say six, Iowa seven, receiver eight, Caleb nine, Brown. Nine, he nine. was uh, formerly at Ohio State, uh, transferred to Iowa. I don't know why. Uh, I, I understand why you left Ohio State. The transfer to Iowa, though. Yeah, currently speaking, 11 players have redshirted with intentions and things. There's been other players who have just entered the portal, but this is specifically redshirting and then with intention portal. So. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, uh, you know what? I I thought the list would probably be bigger, but eleven is still a lot of players. It, it is considering uh, it just. I was just, just a little worried a with that bear move. That ooh, the floodgates might really open here. I would say I think I'm it's actually progressively I'm, gotten more it's happening yeah right i've heard right now uh usc's uh starring inside linebacker eric gentry he's flirting with red shirting sitting out the rest of the year so i i i know there's still guys who, who can red shirt they they haven't played all four games yet so they, they still have that option uh don't need to make that decision yet but i'll take only i, I will take only four or 11 i'll take only 11 guys entering i'll take that uh okay grant so let's let's start with uh i would say game of the week ohio state at oregon yeah uh so th- this is obviously a very big one ohio state open up three point favorite going on the road to eugene oregon Autzen stadium uh let me start off by saying this uh they're at the start of the season watching oregon play as an ohio state fan i felt pretty confident going into this game seeing out the first couple weeks of the season went uh and then the last one or two weeks Oregon has looked more the part uh have closed out games a little bit better uh not been quite on the ropes as they were start of the year uh so Oregon I would say preseason 
I had very a lot of respect for Oregon, respect them a lot, consider them a threat. After the first couple of weeks, that that dwindled. I wasn't looking at, at them as a threat. But after the past two weeks, they're right back to where I viewed them start of the year. Same respect level, fear level of Oregon. Uh, but about the game itself, uh, kind of how I think, uh, just uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago, 2021 season, Oregon walked into Columbus week two uh, without Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, and they beat Ohio State, beat C.J. Stroud in his second career start. Uh, that game, that that one shut me up. I was like, oh, my God, I did not think a Pac-12 Mario Cristobal-led Oregon team would walk into Columbus and just beat us like that, uh, but they did. Uh, and... That was Mario Cristobal. That wasn't Dan Lanning. Uh, so th- there is that. But ever since then, like Oregon, I've respected them knowing that they are physical up front. Uh, in that game, Noah Sewell was a one-man wrecking ball machine, uh, blowing up so many run plays uh, against Ohio State. Uh, he was unbelievable. But I know Oregon is very stout up front. Uh, they're not a team. They're not a quote-unquote Pac-12 team that you can just roll over and bully. Uh, Oregon, in my opinion, they're they're going to have a slight advantage over Ohio State on both lines, O-line and D-line play. Uh, let, let me correct myself a little bit there. Oregon's O-line is better than Ohio State's O-line, uh, but Oregon's D-line isn't as good as Ohio State's uh, D-line. Uh, but in, in the matchups, I do think Oregon may have a slight, slight advantage. I would still give both D lines the advantage over the O lines. Uh, but Oregon, what, one thing I've been looking at so far, and this is going to be my, my stat uh, to look at this game, Oregon has not been efficient in the red zone this year. Uh, they have not been very efficient. Uh, and on defense, they have not been very efficient either in, in not allowing touchdowns or getting stops. Um Everett, uh, of Ohio State's, I, I believe, 24 red zone attempts this year, I want you to guess how many of those 24 Ohio State has put up points. 24. All 24 of 24's Ohio State red zone drives, they have scored points. Everett, of those 24 drives, I want you to guess how many of those ended in an Ohio State touchdown. 21 23 of 24 ohio state red zone drives have finished in a touchdown that is what i call elite um that that's elite shit right there you get in the red zone and you score in college football if you want to win big games you're gonna have to execute in the red zone and walk away with seven not three uh yeah right now ohio state's uh has the number one most efficient offense in the red zone uh and if we're up to me, Ohio State has not been showing their playbook at all up to this point. Uh, past couple of weeks, Ohio State will waltz down the field uh, with Quinshawn and Trevion, and then they get into the red zone. They're on the goal line, and now the running backs are just missing and not in the game at all. And it's just Will Howard quarterback runs, or you just throw a fade up to Jeremiah, and he'll just one-hand moss somebody, and it's a touchdown. Uh, in my opinion, the reason you haven't seen any uh, running back run plays on the goal line is because, well, why put that on tape when you're playing Iowa and Michigan State? Everyone likes to shit on Ohio State's easy schedule at the start. So if it's that easy, uh, why, why would you show any complex things on tape? Um, I don't see the point uh, of doing that. Uh but uh, it's not only red zone offense, but it's uh, also red zone defense. Uh, Ohio State ranks first in the country in red zone defense efficiency. Uh, Ohio State's uh, elite rates, uh, elite efficiency rates. I, I need to pull up the exact uh, numbers real quick just so I, I can get this get this correct. Uh, they bet they better. College football nerds, you're, you're failing me right now. I need these numbers up. I don't have them up right now. God, oh, well. uh, 
anyway, uh, the, the big difference for me are the red zone efficiencies on offense and defense. Ohio State's number one on offense and defense and red zone efficiency. Oregon ranks outside uh, top 50 in both. Uh, Oregon, I think that that's going to be a, a big difference here. Also, I would say I've been pretty disappointed with so, Oregon's wide receivers so far. Uh, I'm getting it from you because you originally gave them. Flat. I'm getting eviscerated on TikTok uh, for for not putting Ohio State as wide receivers and. I'll put a finger up. That's on me. Uh, I didn't. I didn't realize Jeremiah Smith was going to be uh, a top two wide receiver in the country from day one. I I didn't think he was so, going to be that good. Let me. That's let me on ask me. You this. Let Let's go with two outcomes here. All right, of this game, there's two outcomes. One, Ohio uh, State. Ohio State yeah. wins. Nothing really changes. You're still. I'm. I'm guessing predicting Oregon to go to the conference championship game. Now. Mm-hmm. If the opposite happens, if Oregon beats Ohio State, where do we go from here? Uh, in a weird way, I would not. Uh, national title hopes. Uh, well, it depends. If, if like, I'm assuming it'll be a very close game. Um, it like if Ohio State gets shit on by Oregon, boy, Michigan fans, you better tune in next week. You're gonna get a A plus performance <laughs> out of me. Uh, but if Ohio state like loses to Oregon, just barely, I'll be salty for like the next two, three weeks, but objectively speaking, it doesn't impact anything down the line. Well, would you expect Uh, if, if that happens, first of all, I would say there's a better chance Ohio state beats them a sec that second matchup. Oh yeah. That's how I'm thinking to lose. I feel like if, if Ohio state wins this game, it's always hard to beat a team twice, especially in college football. Yeah. But I would say with this well, game, I would be more yes. concerned. They lose that next yes. game. Then so it's... almost in a way I kind of, yes. Like, what you're saying. Play. I'm thinking that like if Ohio state loses to Oregon, I'm now a million percent convinced. Ohio state's the gonna shit thing, on well, Oregon in the big 10 big championship. 10, game. Big 10 championship is in Indianapolis, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I'm, I was trying to remember whether or not it's neutral site. Obviously, it's neutral site. The American Conference is just weird. Um, but I feel like there is a there is a very big difference though going to that game if you feel undefeated. If you're undefeated, rather oh, yeah. than you know, no, it's weird. Like, hey, you know, Chargers, you know, NFL, like they're used to it. They I will you're, say they're going to face three teams for, twice for us when like, we played UCF. That game that we went into it, the fact we lost them pissed us off so much. Yes. That yeah. we just went through and absolutely eviscerated them. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I think of like other recent examples. Uh, I think of like Georgia Bama recently. Remember SEC championship game, Bryce Young, JMO lighting up Georgia, beating them, and then rematch. Georgia comes out, smacks them. Jamo like tears ACL. If Georgia, if tears Georgia ACL. and Bama uh, were to somehow match up in the conference championship, which I don't think is possible I'm anymore, um, very, very unlikely, unlikely with Texas. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I would probably my money would be on. Georgia. Give me Georgia. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but I, I feel like I mean, what Big Ten conference championship wise right now, Ohio State, Oregon, obviously decisive. Indiana is going to be in that conversation because they really don't play anybody besides I think Ohio State. Um, it's just us. <laughs> and I think they're going to be 11. What, what does become interesting, Grant, though, if Ohio State loses to Oregon, Oregon goes through undefeated, and Indiana, Ohio State has a loss, right? Indiana then loses to Ohio State. You have a two, three way tie for that. So Ohio State will have tiebreaker over Indiana. Oregon would have it over. I think it would be Oregon, Ohio State. I don't know how Indiana would have a tiebreaker just, over Oregon. It would, yeah, it would just be it would be interesting. Maybe. To see. Maybe. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm all for it. And hey, as an Ohio State fan, if that does happen uh, to the Big Ten, can you leave us out of that championship game? I'd rather have the five seed. Thank you. <laughs> Rip Penn State, though, by the way. Leave us, leave. Penn, Penn State also well, is well, also in conversation. Well, this for, is the thing. We I think it's I think it's possible to have four 11 and one Big Ten teams this year. Um, you, but I with guess kind you, of. Big 12 I sucks. I think Penn State, Penn State, they face their their tests. It's Ohio State and USC. I guess you... We're assuming well, Penn State's going to beat USC. One, I guess you would probably have an SEC team would be on the chopping block, essentially, if that happened. 
Maybe I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not even thinking that. But, but it's just if you're an 11 and one team in the Big Ten, you're in. Yeah. Um. Speaking of SEC, though, Grant, let's let's look at Ole Miss, LSU. This is pretty big implications for Ole Miss's ability and technically LSU, but more so Ole Miss's ability to make the playoffs. Uh. It, it's oh, this is this is kind of like everything for like Ole Miss cannot drop this game. Uh. Yeah. Like losing to Kentucky is just. Uh, it just throws a wrench in the mix. For yeah, I mean, all of their it's a wake-up up moment. If you lose to Kentucky, that's a wake-up moment. If you can't wake up and you can't beat LSU this season, I mean, that's wrap. It, yeah. it, it was always wraps. Yeah, I, I'll say about LSU, uh, of course, Nussmeyer's very good. Nussmeyer's very good. Lacey's great receiver. Their, their tackles, Will Campbell, I'm free in the other. But uh, offensively, they have a lot of great parts. The LSU defense is still very suspect. That secondary is Swiss cheese, my God. Uh, Harold Perkins uh, also out for the year, but strangely enough, Everett, I think Harold Perkins being out for the year actually helps the LSU defense. Uh, I feel like Harold Perkins being on the defense was actually a detriment to LSU, and he's just this athletic specimen freak that lsu was game planning around they they wanted to focus their defense around harold perkins him as like a little trojan horse or something i don't think harold perkins is a great football player i think he's a freak athlete freak but i don't think he's a very good football player uh can't really blame him for it though uh brian kelly's been his coach for most of his college career so it, it adds up a lot um but despite all of that i I still kind of like LSU, uh, like in this game here. Uh, th- this one's like a weird one for me, uh, where Ole Miss, sure they got firepower. Uh, uh, Trey Harris is absolutely unreal this year, and hopefully he should be playing in this game. I know he's been banged up past couple of weeks, um, but this just seems like a game where just give me LSU. Uh, like I, I think Ole Miss is a better team, but. I don't think it's that. I mean, it's in gap. Baton Rouge, and what what is one of the hardest places to play in the nation? Right? I mean, a lot of people I say understand. it is Death Valley. A lot of people yeah. say that is the hardest place to play. And hey, I can't guarantee LSU stay will be rocking down the stretch if they lose a couple of games. But for this one, for a four and one LSU top ten ranked matchup, I can guarantee. No matter Death what, Ra- Death Valley will be ha- rocking unless for there's this. a blowout. Unless it ends up being a blowout, I can guarantee. Let me see you. when this game kicks off. Fans will Ooh. always show up. Kicks off six thirty p.m. local. Oh yeah, give me LSU. Oh yeah, night game. One, one oh thing I can yeah. Always say. Which, by the way, I just want to ask. I'm, general question: Why does Tulane have to play at eleven a.m. in New in New Orleans in TV Louisiana? Times. But. LSU always plays afternoon because we always have to play when the sun literally like might kill somebody and send somebody to the hospital, whether it's, it's just time slots, but even, even then, like you would market wise, like it's not safe. It is not safe to do that. Um, so have you play at 11? It's literally, it's not like when we played at 11 in Lafayette versus uh, ULL, people were sent like, they ran out of water. People were sent to the hospital. Oh, oh. Like, no, no, I understand the concerns. Do that. The disconnect is um, nobody at the network gives a shit about your health. No, no, they don't. But also, they give a shit about, I guess, how many people actually will. That's the only thing they care about. Uh, but, I mean, 3 o'clock games. I don't give a shit. Put it on ESPN+. Plus. I don't fucking care. I'd rather watch the 3 o'clock game on ESPN+, Plus than an ESPN Central whatever game. Uh, From a fan game. perspective, amen to that. Amen so, to that. They still make money. Anyways, um, all right. Let's let's look at the Red River ri- ri- Red River rivalry. Race. Um, on this on this show moving forward, we'll make an official. Uh, on this show, it will be known as the Red River Shootout. Uh, fair. We're gonna get rid of the tongue twister. We're not we're not we playing by their R rules. Cubes. Triple R. It's the Red River Shootout, everybody. Uh, it's what it should be called. So, um, I just saw a tweet came across. Uh twitter page everett and it makes you feel i i know i just said this about injuries but this is a lot um ever i oklahoma will be without their top five scholarship wide receivers in this game um it seems like a big difference if it was just it? one okay whatever if it was just two i'd say hey it's still the red river shootout the rivalry game shit happens i still don't really care but when it's 
the five best wide receivers out. Okay, now I, I think, now I have to I pay attention. Viewers, um, viewers is back to regardless yeah. if Arch was sorry. I'm still like like hey, it, I said this a, a bit earlier, but Texas is in a very unique situation where they can survive a quarterback injury, and they have past couple of years. Quinn's missed a couple of games uh, every season past couple of years, but uh. With that being said, Arch still puts Texas in a position to win a national championship. I still think Quinn is much better than Arch right now. And like, duh, Quinn's a senior who's played under Sark for like four years. Of course, he's better than Arch right now. Uh, but it is the Red River. It is the Red River shootout. This game is weird. Uh, like games that you think are blowouts, it doesn't happen. Like this game is always crazy. This game is always nuts. Uh, last year, like uh, essentially, Danny Stutzman put the yeah. whole world onto him uh, for his coming out party. Uh, Dylan Gabriel was kind of putting up a performance, though. That oh yeah, no, no, Dylan Gabriel was Dylan team. Gabriel was very good too. Don't don't get me wrong. Uh, I fourteen and a half is just a lot of points. Give me Oklahoma to cover just off of rivalry vibes, but like I do not know how they do it. It just will happen somehow. Yeah. Some way it'll happen. Um, I I don't know how, but weird shit we'll happens in this game. We'll get there. Um, Expect the unexpected. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. Kick off at its old yeah. Cotton Bowl Stadium. Good old Cotton Bowl. Mm-hmm. So, you, you have a history there. Different stadium, but yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, Cotton but... Bowl Stadium is different than the Cotton Bowl. Oh, yes, yes, that is true. Uh, the Cotton Bowl Stadium, that's... Uh, that's like the old venue site. It's yes, the, big the shitty outdoor. one. Yeah, big outdoor. Yes. Not Jerry's World. Not, no, no, be, not... It no, would no, be no, kind no. of sick if it was in Jerry's World, but like, you have to keep that for two different pot. Like, you know, it's got to be different. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of... I, I, I did see I, a I video. I think the Cotton Bowl might literally be only used twice a year. I did see the, a video of, I think last year, it was Texas running out of their tunnel. And it was, they like split the stadium right down the middle. So they run out on the Oklahoma fan side and they cross the Texas fan side. Yes. And you yeah. can just hear it distinctly cut from booze to cheering. Like when they cross the 50. I um, love that. That's sweet. And then Grant, let's get into the last important game of this week. Uh, Penn State, USC. I know USC obviously yeah. uh, choked disgust disgustingly to uh minnesota and everything points towards penn based on that penn state absolutely walking through usc uh, at the coliseum this weekend uh but i think usc's got a little they gotta give a little bit back uh and if they don't uh lincoln riley should be sent to guantanamo bay so so it's kind of something interesting to me uh two guys are like following a lot josh payton cfb nerds they're actually both both their models actually have usc as a slight favorite for this game uh despite the past couple of weeks for usc which was very surprising to me i was like how could you possibly make usc at any point favorite over penn state right now uh i i see a lot of people are are giving respect to the coliseum uh and how loud it is which as a usc alumni who's was just going to USC football games past three years of my life. I don't know what the hell these people are talking about. Uh, I've I, my number one moment at the Coliseum was watching DTR walk into the end zone, go up to an eight-year-old USC fan. His the kid handed DTR his USC hat and a pen, and DTR signed the USC hat. That's my memory. That and Olivia Rodrigo getting on the jumbotron. Those were the two loudest crowd pops I heard at the stadium when I was a student there. So I don't know what the hell these people are talking about saying the Kali will be rocking and stuff. Yeah, the Kali will be rocking with Penn State fans. Like, I don't it's know gonna, what these people are talking be, about. It's going to be silver and blue, the whole stadium. I, I'm shocked what these people are talking about. And like the other thing I will say about USC fans, USC football fans are stupid. They have no idea what they're watching like the couple of true diehard fans they're they're not at the games anymore they know it. this is pathetic they don't want to be associated with that uh but you got some morons out there who are just riding high on 
the Trojan coattail uh, for no reason. Uh, I I think Penn State's going to end up winning this game. I don't think it's necessarily going to be easy for them. I would say Penn State, uh, Penn State the past couple of weeks. Yeah, they are a zero threat to Ohio State. A true non-threat. I have zero stress about that game. Also, uh, that game will be at uh, at Happy Valley. will be at Penn State when Ohio State plays them. But Everett, going back to the TV times, um, Ohio State, Penn State for the rest of eternity is locked in Fox, big noon kickoff. Uh, so that won't be Penn State's whiteout game. That will be a noon kickoff. So because of that, yeah, no. I mean, also, real quick, Ohio State fan coming in here. I don't know what the hell. I don't know what Penn State did to JT Tui Molau, but he just destroys Penn State for fun. And Ryan Day, for some reason, cooks up way harder schemes for Penn State than Michigan. I don't understand. You should save all those trick plays for Michigan, not Penn State. But we burn them on Penn State. No, no threat at all from an Ohio State perspective. But for the rest of the Big Ten perspective, Penn State, the only two teams I'd pick them to lose to is Oregon and Ohio State in the Big Ten. Everyone else, I, I'd pick them to win. I do think offensively, much more firepower this year than in years past. This might be the best Penn State offense I've seen under James Franklin since Trace and Saquon back in 2017. So they they do have an electric offense. They are very dynamic and also shit on that Saquon Trace team. They had Godwin too. And I, I think right before Allen Robinson. So like they had dogs there too. But uh, Penn State, I, I think they've taken a slight step back uh, uh, on defense overall compared to what, what you'd expect uh, out of Penn State defenses in the past. I don't think they're as good defensively, much better offensively, but I think what makes Penn State so scary in the past was having that top five defense every year, just having first round talent littered all over the field, uh, front seven or secondary. But um, still, they outmatch USC. U- USC is just weak, weak, weak at the tackle position and up front. Uh, yeah, Penn State, close, close ish ducky game. Uh, I'll say 31 17, Penn State. I yeah I I would I would agree I would I would like a like a fourteen ten at halftime like yeah I would I I mean I can I I seventeen ten that's kind of more what I'm thinking a seventeen ten two touchdowns field yeah I I would say another thing just objectively speaking compared to big time SEC matchups. Uh, I can understand why the SEC bias is slightly in effect. Like when you have a top 10 big time SEC matchup, you you can kind of expect a, a, a relatively higher scoring, entertaining game offensively. For the most part, when two big 10 teams match up in a big time game, it'll be a gross 24, 20, low scoring, disgusting football game. So I'd expect that to stay true. Penn State, USC, Ohio State, Oregon be relatively low scoring. And Ole Miss, LSU, Texas, Oklahoma to have some fireworks. But yeah, that's that's college football update. Uh, wrap up real quick with MLB here. First, uh, real quick, the Mets are an absolute wagon. Um, I was off. I, I don't, I haven't met many Mets people in my life. Um, but to, to Frank the Tank, and uh, Everett, our, our old uh, middle school uh, PE coach, uh, to them too. Uh, just wow. I, I, I actually, strangely enough, I, I feel, I, I actually do feel somewhat happy for the Mets fans right now. Uh, like seeing Frank the Tank, like actually be happy is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. Cause for the past three years, that way, and then with Frank Oh, they're going to get bounced and he's about to destroy Pete Alonzo right back to yeah. where they were three weeks ago. Oh, no, no, I know Frank, it, nothing's going to change, uh, but they have the team of destiny vibes. It's you can't deny it. They, they have that D backs magic last year, so, that, that so, Phillies magic. Um, Yeah. I- Whoever makes it out of of this Padres Dodgers series is is walking into an app. It doesn't even matter the fact that it's East Coast to West Coast and back and forth. It's an absolute 
Like you, you you're have running to, into you, a buzzsaw. If you do not take game one, the series is over. <laughs> Literally, if you don't take game one versus the Mets, the series is already over. It does not matter. Yeah, like you you, you need to, to leave LA momentum. or San Diego up to up. Yeah. You, like you, you cannot go to New York and give them three straight games with a 1 1 series. Uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah. If, if you're down 0 2 going to New York, you might as well just forfeit. Uh, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> save yourself the pride. I, I uh, do hope, I do hope, like, I, as a Dodgers fan, obviously I want them to win. But as also a Dodgers fan, if the Dodgers lose this game Friday night, there is not another team more that I'm happy to see the Padres have to face. Yes. Yeah. So. Also just, we we were even saying this before the season, before the, all the injuries hit us, like we always knew that like, Hey, this is going to be a great year, but 2025 is where we did. We there's did. truly zero excuses. However, once we get to the playoffs, it's a different feeling. And no, yeah, no, no, I know. Padres, we're, we're it's yeah. even more. No, I know we're, yeah, we're, if we're we had to play teams. like I don't know, yeah, I mean Atlanta. Obviously, you want to beat Atlanta, but beating Atlanta, playing Atlanta would be a little bit different than the pot. So uh, or the like I, the Brewers. I, like... I'd say just slight. No, yeah, yeah, that's the example. Brewers, yeah, there's like zero stress. Atlanta, I got like, some. Even, ju- like even if even if we managed to lose to the Brewers or something like that, I'd be like, shouldn't have lost that, but at least it's not the fuck letting the Padres make it to the NLD uh, NLC. So. I'd like, and I, I'll push back. I'd say right now, uh, the number one team that um, would make me deactivate my Twitter and go offline uh, if we lost them in the playoffs. Number one is San Francisco Giants. Number two is the Padres right now. Yes. Number three. Number three is actually a hundred percent still St. Louis Cardinals. I I will claw my eyes <laughs> out if I ever see us lose um, them again in the playoffs. But, but Grant, uh, I, I think Atlanta's four above D backs. Yeah. Let's yeah. Atlanta let's talk, I cannot stand. Let's talk about uh th- this last game and game game going in game five. So first of all, um the Dodgers have not won a post series season series at Dodger Stadium in front of a crowd. So this kind of COVID since the 2013 NLDS against the Braves. Yeah, First and I was thinking about that, and that second, is shocking to think about. Second <laughs> of all, um, I believe I I'm going off of memory because they displayed this statistic on the broadcast. Um, but in Game Fives at home, the home team I believe is all time 14 and like 21 or something for closing out the series at home. So home teams. I don't remember. What this, like, do you remember a time frame on that stat? Or I, I don't exactly remember. I, I don't know if it was all time or what, but because the 21 seems arbitrary. But all I know is it's 14 wins or 14 series wins at home in game five versus a very large amount more where the away team has closed out the series away on game five. Yeah, I was so. thinking that, that that might not be all time, but. If it's five game series, no, that that probably is the all time record. There, it's there have been that many five game playoff series in LA history. I think it said fourteen. Yeah, no, that that so sounds about there right. There is an innate historical advantage right now for the Padres. Hopefully, the Dodgers can figure it out. Uh, what I will say, um, and we were talking about this, we talked about it last episode, and I, I distinctly made an, a very very clear point that I wanted to see things done differently going into this game in Game Four, um, especially, yeah, Game Four specifically. Uh, I called out Mookie. Mookie showed up. All right. I, I will give him flowers for that. Um, you know, when I said all that, he did re- literally have one hit for like 21 postseason appearances or plate appearances to that point. He got his home runs. I need him to keep that up. Um, but I, I, I will give Dave the credit and say he did. He did do something different. He did something different with the lineup. And he, he quite did literally did everything. Did everything you asked possibly for. different. So and it works, and I am happy to see that that was the outcome, because uh, to that I would point, say, yeah, I, I mean, he well, hadn't done anything differently the first time he does something differently, it works out. Well, well, I I wouldn't exactly uh, say. Hey, uh, I'll be uh, the these past two playoff series, Dave. I I think he's put up his best managerial performances I've ever seen him for the Dodgers. Um, like past couple of runs. Uh, it's not Dave Roberts' fault that Dookie Betts goes up there and shits the bed, and Freddie oh. Freeman's just pops. yeah. As a player, it's not, but coaching it is. 
how? Your job as a coach Dave Roberts to, needs a Will Mookie to hit the no, baseball better. No, but your job as a coach is to prepare your players to the best of their abilities but to how, go into the like game. how do you? Uh, it's mentality. I, I get it's, what you're we saying. We've talked about this though. It's the approach to the game because clearly, clearly though, there's a disconnect. Obviously, there's something internal for Mookie when it playoffs hit because he goes from whatever he's doing in the regular season to not being great in the postseason. My question: What do you want goes, Dave to specifically I, I, do to make Mookie just, better at hitting a baseball? Yeah, let me. First of all, Mookie will go from like an A plus regular season to a B minus in the postseason, at least in hitting perspective. The bigger thing that I'm talking about from the coach's side is, especially when we have a week off, because there's tend to be a connection with Mookie on the Dodgers having a week off and I'm not doing well. There is something in coaching. Well, I'll say telling, this: telling Mookie, hey, hey this is the, we're going to change our approach to something. So we're lifelong work on. Mookie is not great in playoffs. I know, but I'm looking on the Dodgers specifically. Maybe he's just a perennial playoff choker. That's also a possibility. Look at Kershaw, right? But as a general note, like, yeah, it's on the player to make plays in the playoffs. And obviously, when the play is happening, what the fuck is is Dave Roberts going to do? Like, the only thing he can do is sit there and watch it happen, maybe make a man- managerial decision, right? But between the games actually happening and in between bats, as a coach, it's your job to – Take a hold of that player and tell them, hey, this is what we're doing wrong. Let's fix this, or this is how we're going to approach going into this game and changing the mentality around that. And that doesn't just go for Mookie. That goes for every Dodgers player because historically speaking, especially with time off, the Dodgers have all been horrible in the postseason. This year is a little bit different because we've been better. We've gotten better. But historically speaking, the pitchers, the starting pitchers rotation has been horrible. Our bats have been dead cold. Like, that's not just when everybody goes cold. That's not a one-player thing. That's on coaching. Uh, I would say it's a... No, I, no it's not on coaching. Uh, like, it's it's just... It's a dodge. It's like the Chargers chargering. Like, the we're just dodgering. Like, the the all the vibes die the past three years. I see the team, they go up. There's zero fight in them. They've already accepted defeat. Uh, when, yeah, when they comes walk down into to the coach box. mentality. Sure. Okay. But uh, it's not Dave Roberts' fault that Mookie's been shit. Uh, Mookie no, I'm not, had I'm not to pick saying, it up yeah. when you go and when you go up to the after, plate. It's not. Yeah. I I mean, let's just let me just say this: If Dave Roberts were to drop Mookie Betts in the lineup this past game, drop him to like seven hole. I don't know. Whatever. Wherever he drops him, if we were to drop him, and Mookie does bad. Uh, now for the rest of maybe forever eternity, um, Mookie now knows Dave has no confidence in him. Now there's tr- quite literally zero chance of regaining any confidence for Mookie. I mean, that's when I said, gone. When I said, if drop- you keep him up at the top, you it's you're it's a shitty position. You you have to you just have to hope, hope he breaks through. No, that's because uh, that's, for us that's- to win, we're gonna need him. Hitting home runs. That's an entirely top of the valid argument. That's an entirely valid argument. The point I made when I was talking about dropping Mookie was specifically for Teoscar Hernandez, and that was specifically about putting Teoscar Hernandez at two and moving Mookie down to three or four. I was not thinking that Freddie Freeman was going to be out, and obviously if Freddie Freeman's out, then it would literally just be moving Mookie down one spot in the lineup at that point. But... Yeah, yeah, I would say not, like I was not saying they, drop him to seven hole. I was just M- saying Mookie's, move him down maybe in that starting one, two, three. Because you want to get uh, somebody who's going to be on base. And yeah, I mean having home runs is critically important. We've seen that Mookie's figured it out with that at least. Uh, but before, well, yeah, before yeah. that point, he you know he had one home run, he had one hit. Um, yeah, I I know, I'll say that Mookie like he's he he's a star of the team like. Uh, it's it's a shitty position to be in when he's struggling, but like for this team to make a run, we're gonna need him. Like I, I say it every year, one through four is gonna have to hit regardless. If one through four is not hitting, we're not winning. But that's just the start. Like one through four needs to be hitting to win oh, a yeah, World I Series. Fully agree. But then also five through nine, they don't need to be smacking it, but they oh, need to be. Fight not even that. They need to be fighting uh into deep counts. They need to be taking pitchers into deep counts. They need to be knocking guys out of games. 
Like I, the back end of the lineup needs to fight a little bit more. We need to have some more competitive ABs. Uh, when I look at how the Padres play, they're like, it, there isn't an easy out on the Padres. Every single out you have to fight for. You, you, you if you're throwing them outside, guess what? They're taking it. So, uh, and if you get them in a two strike foul, uh, counts, they fight off. Uh, our back end hitters don't do that. And with, you saw what happened game two. Game two, we have to put in Banda as the first reliever in a high leverage situation because all of our all of our arms got burned the day before. Uh, the so Padres, on the other hand, don't have that issue because we're not with, burning their arms. With that set, Grant, let's 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 talk about going into to game five. So uh, in, in right game, now in game four, just yeah. real quick in game four talking about getting shutting down the Padres obviously the one time it worked to the maximum amount possible was when we went through uh a bullpen game so my first question for five was going to be I, I know Yamamoto's starting right now but thinking about all the pitchers expendable this is win or go home what do you want to see out of the bullpen out of Dave Roberts with the pitching staff in that regard, because I feel like that is going to be more important to the game specifically than the lineup is going to be at this point in time. Uh, yeah. So, uh, quick thought on on game four before the game. I was thinking, uh, like Dylan Seas is just the Dodgers' son. Like the Dodgers just own Seas, and so going into game four, the way I thought was Seas. Dodgers will probably put up four runs through five on C's. And I thought if we start knack, I know without doubt that's three runs through four. So I thought to myself, if C's is, if we're going to get runs off C's and we, we are going to put up four over five, if they leave C's in, let's just avoid our starter giving up three through four. Let's just skip that part. Let's just, let's just start with the bullpen. Uh, and so I actually loved how Dave managed this game. Uh, right now, the, Padres, their top hitters, uh, not 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 Arias, but Tatis, uh, Profar, Machado, Merrill, they and, and David Peralta, Jesus Christ, uh, they're all horrifying hitters, and we need our best arms pitching against them. Right now, our starters can't pitch them. No, there isn't a starter on the Dodgers that could pitch them. Bueller, hell no. Yamamoto, God no. Flaherty. Flaherty lit a fire under the Padres' ass. I don't know why. Uh, no, Flaherty can't do it. But our believers can. Uh, Blake Trinan is sunning Manny Machado. Uh, like, Manny Machado is a pretty disrespectful baseball player. I think we could tell that uh, yeah. pretty clearly how he likes to play. It's very rare to see Machado, like, giving respect to a Dodger. But, like, Trinan struck out Machado last night, and I saw Machado give a little tip to cap, like, you got me this there. Was and I was like, after he bitched to the wow. ump real quick. He did yes. bitch to the ump. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, all, we almost like took his head off too. Uh, but uh, like, Blake Trine's a guy that the Padres fear. Uh, it's not though Yamamoto. They're licking their lips for Yama. Uh, so I don't want Yama starting this game. I'm going to be honest. I fully uh, agree with you with that. I do not want Yama to enter this game. Uh, the rumor going on after the past start is that uh, the Padres have picked up on a tip uh, from Yama, and apparently the Padres see something that he's tipping with his pitches. I haven't noticed anything, and but it, I've only heard this with the you, Padres. If you're aware of that, the Dodgers are definitely let's not, aware. Of that. Yes, yeah. So let's, hey, let's just not, let's not do that. Let's not have Yamamoto go up against them. I don't think that's going to be a good idea. Uh, We'll give Flair the start, I guess. Uh, and it's fine that he's on a little short rest. Uh, he pitched game two. So I think he's just as, I think he's coming off three off days here. Uh, so yeah, wait. Yeah, three off three. days. Uh, so four, not, not that much time. Actually, I think it's four. With the bye day. It is four. It's four. It is four. Uh, but I, I expect Flair to get through five, giving up three. And they have Darvish pitching. Um, we have not been able to hit Darvish like ever since he joined San Diego. Uh, but you, Darvish, as a pitcher, he's 
kind of, kind of somewhat like Walker Buehler in a sense where volatile first inning and then he settles in and yeah usually he'll be all right rest of the game but it's Which, it's that first inning you know can he get through i will be honest i do wish we pitched walker earlier because out of all the starting pitchers we have available right now walker although the numbers don't the the, the score doesn't say it walker pitched the oh, best no, no, no. I, podcast, and i would much yeah, rather and, have walker to play yeah. I know he gave up a, a six a six run spot uh, in that second also, inning, but the it was defense, on defense, just, not him. I mean, wow! And this so this was kind of my thought, Brant. There's a two different things that I've kind of been hearing or thinking about. Um, the first thing was Yama starts the game, okay, but we're going to limit his exposure. He starts maybe the first. Maybe the second inning, but mainly the first. Then you start trotting up bullpen guys. You're not letting him get deep into the game. You're not even letting him. Get oh, three so innings. you're so, having him okay. just start so you don't burn as many pitchers. Or I, even I give, you take I give what Flaherty you're saying, but, and you um, put Flaherty in the bullpen and you bring Flaherty out after him. Was another yeah. Thing so uh, no, yeah. If anything, uh, let's go open our game here. Uh, I literally I want Blake Trinan to start the game to get those first three outs. Uh, also. This is another f- a factor about last game that I, I really liked how Dave did. Uh, so uh, I, I just need to quickly, quickly pull this up so I have this right. So, okay. In all honesty, a bullpen three, game sounds great. Through three, Dodgers were up 5 0, and the San Diego's one through three or two through four were about to come up. And I was reading people online being like, what the hell? They're bringing in Kopich already in the fourth? Dave, you're an idiot. No, you moron. That's maybe the smartest shit Dave's ever done in his life. What is the threat from the Padres offense? One through four. So what should you do when one through four is up? Give them your best relievers. You want your best matchups. Screw it. It's NFL football now. Cover one, man across the board. What do you want? We want athlete on athlete. So when their best guys are hitting, let's put our best pitchers in. Uh, And so I was... So on board bringing in um, Kopech in the fourth air because if Kopech gets a one, two, three inning, well, now the lead is still 5 0. And now the Dodgers have two innings where we can tack on some runs before we have to face their one through four again. You get what I'm saying? I, I also will say, by the way, it is incredible. People aren't thinking about it as much, but it is so incredibly important. Evan Phillips pitched, I think, nine pitches. Last night. That was massive. And having him nine pitches, having him be so fresh now going into tomorrow and be available without having burned. Well, it's that also with, with day off, everyone and, is available. And by the way, I know, but even like it's different having I get what you're saying, yeah. 32, right? The, also, like the one I, guy who may be a little Vessia, he threw 30. Vesia, so, yes. Which but, I will say though, him getting through 30 though was very critical to that game. Oh no, he had some and massive pass. I will he say, I think two, um, pitcher wise, um, Trinan, Evan Phillips, I think are my two circled right now. If Vesia is good, that's my next one. But I think Trinan, Phillips, and Vesia are going to be the three most impactful pitchers for this game Friday. Did Michael Kopech die? I was just, I was more so just listing who we had not talked about already. We had already talked oh, about uh, Yeah, I mean, right, dude. Kopech right now has restored faith. In my soul, uh, but with I'm this just, Dodgers bullpen, I'm just trying uh, to think. Like, I know Rob, Dave. If I'm thinking about Dave, my biggest question is, how many pitchers are you going to want to put in the bullpen on Friday night? Whatever you, it takes. But I'm saying, are you going to want to? All of just, them are. Usable. Are we making it? Are we making it a bullpen game, or are we wanting to start with Yama or Flaherty and then work the bullpen after one or both of them? I think he's probably going to start. Flaherty, but like, bro, let's go opener. Uh, like, put like one thing here. that I had this. Heard... Let me opener. I need Trinan getting those first four outs, okay, up to Machado. The second we get Machado out, yanked, and now it's Flaherty start. And I hope yeah, yeah. he so can you're, get you're, through one yeah, through four. You. So he'll come in on the fifth batter. He's 100% facing the five through nine hitters. And then when Luis Arias comes back up, that one through four up to Machado, that's your, if you get through this, Jack, then you stay in the game. If not, 
Yeah. So he's 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 quote, technically coming out of the bullpen, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Think of him as the start, yeah, starter, the but bulk he's reliever. just delaying. You're delaying those first Let's, runs that he would be accountable for for them as of game two. I um, don't feel confident in any of our starters facing the Padres no, one through I don't, four. I'm not either. Do you? So let's have our relievers do, do you it. Think Dave might keep. I think he's a hundred percent in the in the bullpen too, just in case. I wouldn't want to Yamamoto bring Yama out of the not, pen. I know he's not a bullpen guy. He doesn't have a history coming out of the bullpen. But I am just curious, given the circumstances, if this is a special exception, Dave might just be like, "Fuck it." Hey, Dave's done this in the past. Like so, we we we've used stars out of the like. Hey, if that's like a in case of emergency break, break glass situation, like we're not planning on it, but like if need if need be, Yamamoto, you better you better pound that Red Bull. You're coming in, buddy. <laughs> uh, so, like, I don't want to use that as a plan. I don't want to rely on that strategy at all. Like, that's a last case. Now, the like, the one thing yeah, I will say ultimately. Hit- yeah, no. Pinning uh-huh. wise, I think I think no matter what, the bullpen has showed that for us to win game five, it needs to come out of the pen. You cannot have a starter be in there versus the top bit or be in there for a long period of time because we will give up five runs. Um but going Yeah, I'd say hit, this is just an imperfect strategy on like a one it's game. It's not basis. sustainable for seven games. <laughs> yeah. If we if we win this, you go to the match, it's be not sustainable. You're gonna need knack. Knack is gonna need to be the fourth pitcher. For that game, like, you cannot have. I'll a be honest, game. I, I was also just thinking the other day. Hey, I remember Yama's last start before he got hurt and seven scoreless in Yankee Stadium. Kind of feeling the juice on another Yama start in New York at City Field. I, I don't know. That's I'll fine, know. but then you get. I, into I'd want that. Four. Uh, you, get, you have to have four four pitchers. You can't have a. Board. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I you, you know I'd say this though. Just clo- closing thoughts. Um, that eight zero win inspired inspired something in me which i haven't felt in a while watching the dodgers play uh i i thought this team was going to collapse and fold over i had zero expectations winning but they they won and they smacked him in the mouth and they kept on fighting the whole game i think it was really important that they didn't give up just a pity run at the end too by the way yes no 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 keeping keeping your foot on their neck and don't let them breathe for a second i loved it i love dave not letting Knack, uh, Knack just get those last three innings. No, I love him. No, no, let's keep the big boys in. I don't want them having any, any vibes going into a game five. I want all their hitters feeling in a slump. Like, I, you I don't want to give them say, an ounce of You want to talk about momentum? Dodgers gave the Padres momentum in game two. They carried that oh, to game three yeah. back to back. You now see momentum in Padres Stadium, all, and it's the Dodgers. No, no, now it's all. That's your back-to-back window. You get the no, momentum yeah, like that. Yeah. I will also say game one. I would not say the momentum was in the Dodgers' favor after game one. I would still say, even though the Padres lost, the Padres had the momentum. Yeah, no, no. That, that was a this neutral momentum game. This is completely different. No, this yeah, is different. Yeah. And I will ask, the closing thing for this. No, game. this feels weird. I feel some juice. Like, closing I, I was thinking. Thought, just. You go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, my close thought was, the Mets are hot right now. and They look scary. But what if the Dodgers are hot, Everett? I don't think anybody in the MLB wants to face the Dodgers when the Dodgers are hot. Uh, here, here is my my closing. I never question. thought about that angle. What if we're hot? Oh shit! Dodgers did this without Freddie Freeman, without Miggy. Do you keep the slam lineup from last night? I know there's a thought of changing out CT for for Pajes. Um, but Ooh, I'd say let's change out you, CT for Pajas, take them both out. I, I want my boy Enrique Hernandez playing center field. Well, no, no, I, but I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying who, who did they have at shortstop? Because originally they were talking about moving Kike to, to center field. It should be Edmund. But Edmund yeah, at Edmund shortstop was at it. Play short. Yeah. So also Kike, by the way, unbelievable batting right now, at least yeah. statistically from, from what I saw. But my, my last question, Grant, is um, my closing thought is based on what happened last night. Uh, or, or uh, I guess Wednesday night. Um, do you keep Freddie as a scratch? Do you scratch him? You just let it let the just the juice flow from what we had. From a pure vibes perspective, I I think you bench Freddie, and I, I wouldn't say it's even it's... a bench, but yeah, 
yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think um, we do not start Freddie Freeman in the game, and I think in the top and ninth, it'll be a tie ball game, uh, and I think that'll be the perfect time to pinch hit Freddie Freeman and give him his Kirk Gibson moment when Kirk Gibson hit the walk off home run uh, for the Dodgers in the nineteen eighty seven World Series, eighty six, eighty eight. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, this is pure baseball nerd historian, but, uh, if there is a situation where it's a tight game in the top of the ninth and Freddie Freeman were to pinch it coming off a bad leg injury, I know there's at least one person out there listening who appreciates this. Uh, yeah. Uh, from those vibes, bench Freddie and be ready to hit in the ninth. Let's create the Kurt Gibson pinch hit home run. Let's let's and, do it again. Uh, and with that, we'll wrap up here. So with that, thank you guys so much for watching, listening, raise five stars. You can find us on Spotify, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, and on Instagram at Waterboy Pod. You can follow me around on Twitter at Everstakes and at Waterboy Grant. Uh, we post new episodes every week, so make sure to subscribe. Or uh, it's on YouTube and all podcast platforms. So make sure to subscribe, turn on notifications, so don't miss a single episode. We also post exclusive content on Instagram and on TikTok. So make sure to check us out there. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in the next episode. Waterboy's out.